you're working so that's all over Great. to you Great. Thank you. So, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Fiona. Thank you for the introduction, Gordon. I'm so pleased to be here today. Um, this is a little bit about me. I work in the um, so my work in the charity sector and in teaching in multicultural areas and marrying my husband, who's from Ethiopia, really made me realize that I had a lot to learn about race. After the murder of George Floyd, I was a few years further along in my studying than most white people. And so I was able to lead anti-racism book discussion groups in and out of work and with teachers and students at Hearts and Essex. Alongside colleagues of color, I set up various anti-racist projects in my workplaces since then. So I am definitely not an expert, but I'm still learning and I'm looking forward to sharing some of what I've learned with you today and looking forward to our discussion afterwards. So we're going to cover the history of British racism, how um, racism looks today, why it's persisting, and what can we do about it. So we know that racism is a social construct. Science shows that we are all one human race descended from a common ancestor in Africa. The people who moved into colder and darker places lost various levels of melanin, the hormone that gives color to our skin, as it wasn't needed to protect them from the sun. And racism between groups has not always been there. Accounts of Africa from European travel writers in the 1300s express the great wealth that Africa has. They spoke of complex political and governance systems more advanced than those in Europe. They spoke about great riches of Mansa Musa, who's the richest man to have ever lived to this day, of the first university in the world, the University of Timbuktu in Mali, of the architecture of the rock -hewn churches in Ethiopia, the Kingdom of Benin, and the international trade routes between African kim kingdoms. So the first articulation of the concept of race can be traced back to a man called Gomez de Zuara, a Portuguese man who wrote a book in the 1450s, which lumped all of the diverse kingdoms and peoples and ethnic groups in Africa into one group and described them as inferior and beastly. So why? So he was hired by the Portuguese king to write this as a few years prior, Portuguese traders pioneered the slave trade. So a story was needed about the inferiority of African people in order to normalize this barbaric practice. And so blackness and whiteness was invented. Other countries soon followed this lead and the elaborate descriptions of Africans' intelligence and assets turned into describing them as savages, more like animals, primitive and unintelligent. In 1578, the British travel writer George Best misinterpreted the ninth chapter of the Genesis of Genesis in the Bible, where the descendants of Ham, who's the darkest skin of his brothers, were cursed by Noah to be servants to the descendants of his brothers. This provided an explanation of why black skin existed and a neat justification of slavery for the church. And so biological racism was born. This is the belief that races are meaningfully different in their biology and that these rate differences create a hierarchy. This concept was then reinforced over and over by governments and government funded writers and scientists who carried out very unscientific experiments, which funnily enough proved that black people were biologically inferior and should there therefore be exploited through slavery. Now it's been proven that there is no meaningful biological difference between racial groups and in fact there's more difference in DNA within racial groups than between them. Whilst the US benefited from this propaganda as a justification for, justification for slavery and later segregation, the UK benefited from it as a justification, justification of slavery and later colonialism. But by the 1930s this was the same theory that Hitler was using to justify the Holocaust and the reaction to the Nazi Holocaust made biological racism seem too extreme for most people to openly accept anymore. So they turned to cultural racism. Cultural racism is the belief in a superiority of language, values, beliefs, worldviews, and cultural artifacts. Cultural racists believe that black people in Africa were biologically the same as white people, but were culturally deficient. Though they could be taught British culture, and this would make them civilized. Later, another moment in history 
made it unde undesirable to be seen as a racist at all. The civil rights movement in the US in the 1960s allowed people across the globe to see the televised brutality towards black people asking for their civil rights. And they moved away from any open admission of cultural racism. Since then, it's been more and more socially unacceptable to be openly racist. The vast majority of white people will proudly claim to be not racist and for a long time professed, I don't see color. Col colorblind racism is perpetuated in phrases such as, I don't see color, I don't care if you're black, white or green, I don't see you as black. It stems from the phrase in Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech that stated he wanted to live in a society where people are judged on the content of their character, not the color of their skin. This was jumped upon as a solution as the as a solution to the problem of racism. You pretend you don't see race and the racism disappears. Great. However, we just need to look at a few of the statistics of disparities between ethnic groups in the UK to see that not seeing race has not eliminated racism. Color blindness ignores the realities of racism today. If you don't see color, how will you see that your company systematically rejects qualified people of color and it hires only white people? If you don't see color, how will you see that your curriculum is only white people and other people's history has been erased? If you believe that you are color blind, then you believe you can never be racist. But it does not mean that racism doesn't exist. So biological, cultural and color blind racism haven't gone away. They all show up today in different forms of conscious and unconscious biases. These manifest in our society in the UK as system, systemic racism. This is when people with the same conscious and unconscious biases join together in an organization, they act according to those biases. This pro then produces structures within our systems, such as education, politics, health, private sector, which keep reproducing racist outcomes. We can look at the structures of racism by taking an example of a black boy starting school. Black school boys are three times more likely to be excluded compared to the whole population. His teachers will likely to treat him and other black students as a group rather than an, an individual. What this means is if another black student misbehaves in class and then he misbehaves a few days later, research shows that the teacher is likely to discipline the black boy as if he's misbehaved twice which they don't do with their white students. When he takes his SATs exams, research shows that he'll be marked down by his own teachers. This will only be remedied, remedied if an independent examiner marks his anonymous test. When he gets to university, he will likely be less likely to be accepted to a Russell Group University than white students with the same grades. When he graduates, even with it, if it's with a top degree, he will be called to less interviews than people with white British sounding names. In his personal life, it's probable that he'll have some contact with the police. Between 2017 and 2018, black people in Britain were around 10 times more likely to be stopped and searched by the police than white people. He'll be more than twice as likely to be charged with drug possession, despite lower rates of drug use in the black population. In the process, he'll be five times more likely to receive a harsh, harsher receipt police response. If he has a child with a black wife, she'll be five times more likely to die in childbirth than a white woman. A 2016 study showed that black patients were 20% less likely to receive pain medication from medics, most likely due to un the unconscious myth that they feel less pain. These are just some of the of many more statistics of how the black man's life will be affected by systemic racism in the UK. The statistics are shocking and start to give you a picture of how the odds are stacked against people of color to succeed in our society. With their permission, I want to give some personal examples of racism that comes from my husband and some of our, our friends, as I feel they add some color and meaning to these statistics. So when my husband first came to the UK six years ago, he applied to entry level customer service jobs at all the shops and restaurants on the high street in Bishop Stortford. Despite his college diploma, fluent English, 
years of experience as a manager working with British colleagues in a British charity in Ethiopia. He wasn't invited to any interview but one. When we looked at the application, my laptop had accidentally autofilled with my name and we didn't notice. All the qualifications, all the schooling in Ethiopia was the same, except for now it had a British sounding name on it. This was likely not a coincidence based on the research. When he'd been in the UK for a few months, he had got on the wrong train. He, the conductor came and he explained and showed the ticket that he did have so that he could get help to get the right one. Instead, the train conductor said that he was evading a fare, didn't let him buy a ticket or pay the standard 20 pound fine, but did the most extreme thing that they can do, which is to give him a court order. We had to hire a lawyer and pay a 200 pound fine out of court to get rid of this as going to court and having this on his record would have affected his ability to renew his UK visa. I've been on the wrong train, lost my tickets quite a few times, and I've always just been allowed to buy the right fare. Despite being totally overqualified, the only job that my husband could get in Stortford was pot washing for one of the high school canteens. When he got there, they gave him a lanyard, his ID. The manager explained to keep it in his locker, wear it throughout his shift. After working there for a few months, he happened to be walking through the car park to work at the same time as the head teacher. The head teacher questioned him and he had to prove who he was and was told from now on he needed to wear his lanyard on the way into work and from work as well as in the building. This was not made policy for every worker, just him. He was viewed as a threat whilst carrying out normal activities as a result of his skin color. My husband had a white dental surgeon in Lister Hospital in Stevenage who did not believe it when he told him that the anesthetic was not working and he, when he was having his second wisdom tooth out. The surgeon carried on removing the tooth, didn't stop even when the dental nurse pointed out that my husband was sweating in pain. I've never seen him in so much pain when he came out of that operation. Yet multiple times I've told my dentist that the anesthetic wasn't working and they've just given me a bit more until I was numb. My husband, he's the only one of all of his black friends that have not been stopped in search. And I can't explain the fear that I have when he's out at night that he will be stopped and hurt by the police. My best friend, she's from Hong Kong. She works for a major supermarket. Her colleague a few months ago told another colleague that he hates Chinese people. She reported this, but the manager said that the man was only joking. It wasn't worth escalating it. This was, this was going to risk the man not getting a promotion. It wouldn't be fair. So she had to change her shifts to not see him, whereas he just had a verbal warning and carried on as normal. Before Christmas, the same colleague said to another colleague that he hated my friend and pulled at the side of his eyes to mock her. It's taken seven weeks to look into and she's still waiting on an outcome, despite this being caught on CCTV. One of our friends, a black man, has worked his way up to upper management in the company he works for. He's afforded his dream car, a Range Rover. He then started being frequently pulled over and searched, multiple times being handcuffed onto the front of his car while all his belongings were thrown onto the pavement and then the police would leave without apology or explanation. This happened so often, he was so often late to work in the morning that he sold the car after eight months and bought a cheap car so he could fit into the police's idea of what a black person could achieve and he could just get through his week without being searched. Despite my husband being overqualified and overexperienced for his role, he's never been offered training courses or promotion at his company. We've always had to pay for outside training so that he could get better roles. Uh, my husband has been followed around clothes shops in Westfield Stratford by security guards so many times that he just goes shopping with me. He's been denied from bars while others have been let in. He's had women grab their handbags when he, when he walks past them on the, on the street. And him and our other friends have experienced more microaggressions than I could list in this whole talk. I just wanted to share an idea of the barriers that it takes for people of color to move through the world. Not only are there structural barriers in place to stop them from progressing, but they also have this extra emotional and, physical and psychological effort to move through the world just doing normal activities. I wish I could know that this list would end now, 
that it wouldn't be added to. I'm currently seven and a half months pregnant and I wish that I could protect my unborn son so that in the future he did not have a list of ways that racism affected his life. But I'm deeply, deeply sad in my knowing that this won't be the case. I'm sure that you and everyone you know are also good people who wish this for my unborn son as well. So how does racism still persist today uh, when most of us just wish it would go away? These are some of the main reasons why. Um, a lack of understanding, white fragility, white privilege, white apathy, lack of education, and being believing that being not racist is enough. Let's just touch on white privilege. This often misunderstood term does not mean that you have not had struggles or are living in an economically or socially privileged position in relation to the rest of the population. This means that you have the privilege of going through life not having to think about race, not having the constant microaggressions and the examples of racism that I've just gone through. Therefore, you're largely unaware of racism and what you can do about it. The Another reason is a flawed understanding that we have of racism. There is a belief that racism is single overt acts committed by bad people. And this means that we're unable to address what racism is as it manifests today. We need to understand that racism is based on prejudice plus power. So we normally believe that it's just a few overt acts, but there's actually the bulk of racism is covert. So prejudice, we know is the conscious and unconscious prejudgment about a person based on the social group that they belong to. All humans have this, and despite not being explicit, explicitly taught them, it's unavoidable for you to have lived in this society without gaining prejudice against other groups. After hundreds of years of racism, it's, and only a re relatively recent turnaround, it's not surprising that these messages are passed on to us. Racism is having unconscious prejudice plus power. So the power I'm referring to can be shown in these statistics, which show that white people hold disproportionately high number of positions of power in this country. This definition allows us to see racism for what it actually is. But our false definition of racism as bad things done by bad people has created an unhelpful good bad binary. So we believe that racist that good people are not racist they're educated they're open-minded they're nice bad racists are bad people they're ignorant they're prejudiced and they're mean so the idea that good people are not racist and racists are bad people underpins our inability to look at our own racism there's a myth that only people who consciously dislike and discriminate against others hold any racial prejudice when we hear the word racist, it makes us think of people who are consciously white supremacist, quite evil people. And we are socialized to know that being racist is bad, so racists are deemed as bad people. But when your friend at the dinner table says that black people he thinks has a naturally lower IQ than white people, his friends and family will probably not want to label this him as racist, perhaps using the claims that oh, he didn't mean it like that, oh, he's such a good guy, oh, he, he works for the black guy, to justify him as not being racist. This shows the definition of racism that we are using is one of conscious dislike. In fact, you can be a good person, kind and generous to your friends and family, work well with colleagues of colour, be nice to black people, and still hold racial prejudice. All white people do. If you are a white person, then you will have thought, said, or done something in the past that was racist. I'm going to say that one more time. If you are a white person, you will have thought, said, or done something in the past that was racist. I imagine that statement will have made a lot of you feel very defensive. That's the most natural reaction that we've been socialized to feel. One of these statements is probably running through your mind right now. You know, I, I see everyone the same. You know, I, I have a multiracial family member. But I encourage you to not mentally check out. It's normal, something called white fragility talking. 
The key to moving forward is what we do with our discomfort. We can use it as a door out, blame the messenger and disregard the message, or we can use it as a door in by asking, why does this unsettle me? What would it mean for me if this were true? Remember, this isn't an attack on your character or to say you're a bad person, rather a comment on the fact that it would have been impossible to grow up without absorbing any prejudice about other races. I'm including myself in the statement as well. I know that how, no matter how much I learn, I will always be unlearning my own racism and learning anti-racism. So we found another thing that allows racism to persist today, which is white fragility. The false definition of racism and the good bad binary has meant that white people have white fragility, which makes us terrible at having productive conversations about race. Robin D'Angelo defines white fragility as a state at which even a minimum amount of racial stress becomes intolerable, triggering a range of defensive moves. It's when white people react with being overly sensitive, defensive and emotional when people try to speak to them about race. It comes out in a range of emotions, usually when someone tries to correct or racism. It can be fear, anger, panic, discomfort, crying, leaving the conversation, either mentally or physically, or calling the authorities, the police, the manager, the teacher to take your side. This reaction is because the word racist immediately brings to mind the idea that you're a bad person, done a horrendous thing, when in fact you are just being told that specific thing you said causes harm and you are not aware of this yet. Without being aware of your white fragility, it's near impossible to do any anti-racist work. Finally, we're going to the final way. There are, there are more ways that, that racism is allowed to persist, but the final way we're going to look at today is believing that being not racist is enough. Most of us believe we are not racist people, and so therefore we don't need to do anything to tackle racism as we have not contributed to it. In fact, we all have unconscious bias, and so when we're not aware of it, we're contributing to the racist systems that we are in. Ibrahim Kendi believes that there are only two ways to be, either racist or anti-racist. Anti-racists are not passive, but they're ones who are actively learning about racism, they're interrupting racism wherever they see it, and they're creating change in organizations and policies that they have influence in. Anti-racists use models of equity rather than equality. And uh, I just feel like these cartoons explain equity and equality better than I can. So the, if you're not racist, you'd think these people are equal and I will just don't need to have any in, intervention in this place. But um, anti-racist go for equity rather than equality. So this means like this um, diagram, putting in extra steps to help people who have been disadvantaged. So what can we do about it? And this is, I, I got into the cartoons by this point. So this is um, a great way to show that uh, white people should be the ones doing this kind of work, not just people of color, because we have so many less barriers to doing this work. So these are some of the things that we can do, kind of starting with ourselves, starting internally, is updating and understanding the definition of racism as unconscious bias plus power, reading books, listening to TED Talks, podcasts, reflecting on your own racism, practice reacting without white fragility. So when you feel um, that something you're reading is maybe calling all white people racist and you don't want to think about that, going more in depth and understanding why you're feeling like that and how you can overcome it. Calling This is calling yourself in when you notice unconscious biases come up. If you see someone in the street and you have an unconscious bias, which many of us do, correcting that in the moment. And because you can't control your first thought, but you can control your second thought. And diversifying the stories you read, the films you watch, and the people that you associate with. 
but going outwards, what can we do about it? Uh, influencing other people. So we can recruit people to diversify um, the board of trustees or the governors uh, that you're on. There's, I think, I believe 92% of um, trustee boards are all white. Um, and so these are, often doesn't reflect the population that they're trying to serve. Um, any recruitment processes that you're involved in, you can make them anonymous. If the my husband's name hadn't been on all his applications, he probably would have got interviews, they would have met him, he probably would have got a job. You can attend protests which demand, rac demand racial equality, um, such as for refugees or against police brutality. You can sign and share petitions. You can call out people when they say something racist and be the person to report it. So my friend uh, who worked in the supermarket, she shouldn't have heard through the grapevine that someone had said something racist about Chinese people and then about her. They should have been the people to call it out with that person and then report it and deal with all of that with management. She should not have had to have done that herself. Um, developing cross-racial relationships, buying children grand and grandchildren books on race and talking about it with them. There's a study which shows that um, children as young as um, nursery school have racial prejudice. It was called, um, I think, the Dole study, where they where children would assign more positive words to dolls that, that were white and negative to those who were black. And actually this is quite easily remedied when they were then talked about, talked to about race, when they read books about this, this topic and the, te the test was repeated, they, this was actually remedied and they weren't um, having these biases. Um, asking schools, that you're involved with to educate children about racism, to add this to the curriculum. Donating non-fiction books about racism to school libraries. Donating to anti-racist causes. There's an organization called Stand Up to Racism and they have an East Hearts branch that you can join. You could start a two-way mentoring program in your organization. This is something I started at Macmillan, which pairs someone who is a person of color in a junior position with a white person in a senior position. And the not only is the white person, the senior position, mentoring that per, the junior person to um, help them with their career, but the junior person also mentors the senior person to help them understand about racism and see the ways in the organization that can be changed to support people of color to thrive there. Um, you can request the organizations you're involved with invest in anti-racism training, which is delivered by people of color. You can stop and being obse um, an observer and support people of color who are being stopped by the police or train conductors. Many people after my husband's incident on the train said to him afterwards, I cannot believe that, that they treated you like that. That's so bad. But no one actually spoke up in the moment and asked, why are you giving such a harsh um, reaction to this man who clearly just made a mistake. Um, you can understand and support reparations. You can request that organizations you're involved with carry out a race pay gap report just as they do for gender pay gap. You can create surveys for organizations that you're involved with so that they can um, assess what they're doing um, to improve diversity. And you can ensure that they then have real targets for racial equality and ways to be accountable with real consequences, the same as when other targets in the organization are not met. Um, so thank you so much for listening. Um, I really appreciate it. Are there any questions? Do you feel like there were any actions um, on the list that you feel like you could take? Are there other actions, things that I haven't said? Um, that you could, that you think would be great to share with the group that you've taken or are planning to take. Um, yeah, no, I'll open it up to everyone. I'll stop sharing. Thanks very much, Fiona. Uh, like your last presentation, um, you've 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 probably shocked us all. 
Uh, nobody on this call will think that they're racist, um, but you're challenging us all that perhaps we are. Uh, so could I open it for questions? You know, just remember, <coughs> you're all muted, so you need to <coughs> unmute before you speak. Right, Jim Tatchell. Hi, thank you, Fiona. And I'm finding it a bit difficult to speak because I'm quite shocked. Um, and that's helpful. I think we need to be, and those of us that have never really considered what you've been talking about need to consider it. So thank you very much for that, um, I think. But no, thank you. When recruiting for boards of trustees, um, when we've had this question in the past, it's been um, looking at the skills that you need on a board of trustees. And somewhere like Bishop Stalkford, it's really hard because there are probably, I don't know, if there's six secondary schools and probably 16 primary schools and they've all got boards and PTAs, that's a lot of diversity that you need to find in a relatively small group of people. How would you suggest we as trustees should go about finding people that would be willing to join the boards? What's the best way to go about finding people that might be um, of a different cultural background that we'd be looking for to join our boards? But how, how can we go about that? Yeah, that's that's a great question and something I'm quite involved with at my work at the moment. Um, the So I think the best ways to, to first include in your job description that you are specifically looking that you welcome applications from everyone but you would really love some people with lived experience um, of you know being a person of color to help the board um, and that that encourages people first of all to apply who may not have otherwise they may have seen a full whiteboard and they might have said I don't think I'm going to fit in there they, they might not be listening to me but that you're actually calling out for them is going to help um there might be a way also for you to as you said there's so many boards is there a way to have someone maybe as an advisor rather than on the board and uh, where they have less hours that are, that are needed um and then so it, it is a bit it is obviously easier in london where there are groups but i'm sure that there are groups for example uh the charity i'm a trustee for um is based in East Africa. So we then looked for, you know, community groups um, that of, of groups of people from East Africa that then we could advertise in. Um, I think those would be my main suggestions for now, but I will also share, when I share slides and things, um, the website Getting On Board, which has so many resources for um, recruiting diverse trustees, it's what they, they specialize in. Um, so I'll share that as well. Thank you. That's really, really helpful and, and a great answer. Thanks. Fiona, um, it's Gordon here again. I was on the board of the University of Hertfordshire and they went to extreme efforts to try and uh, recruit people of colour onto the board. I'm not, I've am not. i been off the board for the last three or four years, so I'm not quite sure where it currently is. But they were advertising in parts of London where they're more likely to people of colour to see the adverts. Uh, they were excluding any white people from actually getting the job, um, and they still failed. Uh, there just seems to be a lack of people of colour wanting to participate in these areas. Yeah, there, there, there is a lack of people feeling like that that's their place to be because of, um, because of how white the boards are, um. There's, yeah, as I said, getting on board, they are working with um, people to train up diverse trustees so that they can you know, address this. Um, yeah, I, I do acknowledge it's a problem. And, um, uh, but I think, yeah, it's great that it's great that people are trying and that I think mm -hmm. the more they are, the more that people are going to see that that, that is their place and they, they should be applying for these roles. Yeah, Peter Latham. 
Yes, hello, Fiona. Um, I, uh, I do agree with so much of what you say, um, and many of your solutions, I'm sure, are the solutions which are likely to get improving results. But my concern is that um, there seems to be a belief that racism is, um, if not exclusive to whites, is particularly a problem with white people. And uh, this is something I do find difficult to believe. Uh, my starting point is that <clears throat> um, until about six or eight thousand years ago, uh, humankind existed in small to gather a family groups and um, as with all uh, pack groups of creatures they would stick together and they would fear the unknown uh, and this is something that i suspect is deeply ingrained into the human psyche uh, the fear of the, the different the fear of the unknown and it's only with the advent of uh, civilization from about six thousand years ago that people have come together and suppressed some of the instincts which are quite natural and one might say genetically bred into people. Uh, and I think that uh, what you refer to as racism, what we understand as racism, is probably deeply seated in everyone. Um, and that all people uh, suffer from this and civilization is a way in which we suppress it uh, and other instincts which, um, which human beings have. Now, my concern is that by uh, labelling white people as being uh, racist in a way that no other group is or no other, or particularly so in white people, this is something that in itself causes dissent and um, feeling of uh, unfairness or something that's not quite right uh, and it's divisive. I think we've got to find ways of dealing with these problems which I can see to absolutely are racist and uh, we've got to do everything we can to suppress what you define as racism. But I think we've got to find ways of doing it in a far more inclusive manner rather than being a purgative uh, term which is used against whites who are in this particular point in time uh, in Western civilization probably in numbers dominant. It won't be that way for long. Um, I think we've got to be more understanding of this and less purgative and less divisive. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. Um, the um the definition of racism that um i've been using is the prejudice plus the power so for example one person could you know be from a different uh let's say indian person doesn't like white people and they don't hire them in their organization but the fact that white people make up, I can't remember this is sick, 95% of CEOs, you know, and certain number of hiring managers, they can systematically block people of color from um, progressing or being hired because they have that power. Whereas um, people of color, def there's definitely, uh, you know, xenophobia and racial prejudice between groups as well absolutely I haven't had time to go into that but um there's not that power to to create a system which which stops people um stops whole groups from progressing if that makes sense um and what, what, what about when uh, you go to other countries where there's a predominance of uh... India is probably an example. There are a residual number of white people left in India. There are people referred to, used to be referred to as Anglo-Indians. Um, somehow or other, there isn't the same aggravation created by these people that seems to be created by 
uh, incoming minority groups in this country. I think they 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 still, as a hangover from colonialism, still have a level of of privilege. And I'm I'm really not an expert on on um, I don't think India. They do, I, don't, but... I think many of them don't have that privilege. Some do, but not many. Right, I'm, I'm going to invite Anne Louise, which, who's got a point to make, I think. Um, yes, well, thank you very much, uh, Fiona. I'm most interested because many years ago when I was at university, I did African history as a special subject. Oh, wow. And, uh, it, 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 and I learned an awful lot then. But I just wanted to ask a question re relating particularly to Britain, but um, you're talking about the difficulties that people of colour in Britain are having. But I'm very aware that until, I think, whether it still exists, but until very recently, Irish people in Britain had similar problems. They couldn't get work. They were disqualified from all sorts of uh, layers of society. So have you thought of looking at that in relation to what you've talked about today, the difficulties that people of colour have? Yeah, so... Um... I I mean, I just want to say, because I see that as a form of racism myself. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, mm. Definitely it was. And the, um, I cannot remember the dates and the exact, all, all of the exact facts about this, but um, I know that I've read that generally it, it was when working class people, um, you know, needed to band together that that um that um the government kind of would rather that white people all banded together and inc start including Irish people in that rather than um having all working class people, including people of color, banding together. Um, I've read some really good things on this, but it's been a long time since I've <laughs> uh, since I have. Um, but maybe I can share something. That will shed a little bit more light on it um, when I share the slides and things. That's okay. Well, thank you. So, you know, uh, Peter talked about India. Um, I've not spent much time in India, but I've got the class system in India, and there, there's a total lack of respect between the higher classes and the lower classes, which in some ways is racism. Um, I found it quite extreme and more extreme probably than in this country. And they're open with that as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, can I reflect back to the Griever question on why we want to start talking about other countries or, you know, other groups rather than, why do we think that is rather than um, reflecting on the UK or reflecting on you know, things that we could be doing productively now. Fair point. Um, right, any other, uh, Jackie? You're muted, Jackie. I think in answer, Fiona, to exactly what you just said was that um, in my head, racism is, is a whole thing. It's not just blacks it's not just china it's not just india it also covers different races and religions so i suppose what you're trying to do is bring us back to we're discussing black here aren't we we i've mainly used facts from from black people because it's they're the kind of the most studied in this but there is obviously you know if i had more time then we would we would go into all the all the statistics from all the groups so we can discuss for for any group yeah yeah I think I think um, listening to you, it, it, there are it's a whole world out there of racism, um, and I wasn't unfortunately shocked about everything that you said, knowing that my sons have loads of black friends or and what they've come across or haven't come across and different religions and stuff. So um, it's it's. It, it's, it's harrowing. It's 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 very hard. I'm I'm really sorry for your husband that he's been through this, and anyone else who is going through this. Um, don't know what we can do. 
Well, Fiona's come up with some ideas, I think. Um, any other question? Any other points to make? Mary's got something to say. You're muted, Mary. You're still, still muted. muted. You're still muted. I wish I had this tool at home. <laughs> oh boy, just you wait, mate. Um, how did your husband cope with all this and um have things improved? Um, I would say that coping has just been unfortunately people just accept it. Um, you know, once they move here or things they just they just have to accept it and and try and get on with it. The um things I would say in, in the in the six years haven't haven't improved. Um unfortunately it would be really great to say that they have, especially since the Black Lives Matter movement in 2020. And there was at that time just so many things going on with every organization, everyone was talking about it. And from all the organizations I'm involved with now, it really just feels like it's just dropped right off the agenda again and things have gone gone back to where they were there's not that same awareness and the things that they promised that it hasn't there hasn't been the follow-through but there has been no consequences for that follow-through so you know in other areas of the business where you know if you don't meet your sales or something then there's going to be remedial action you know if people don't if people consistently fail on certain things then you know jobs could be lost you know it, it would be a big deal but these things they they you know there's there's just been a lack of accountability um and that's one of the reasons that I, I think that you know we haven't made that made that progress um yeah and is government failing people of color pardon is government failing in this area how is the government feeling Oh, no, are they failing? Are they letting... Oh, are they failing? Sorry. Um, um, yes. <laughs> I mean, the the if if you take different areas like the you know the latest parts of the curriculum where, um, you know they have they had real opportunities to include um parts parts of history that that are British history. You know, colonialism. I got through my entire um school education without knowing the word colonialism I, I did not know that it had happened and this was I was going to Hearts and Essex it was a very highly you know esteemed school at the time um and yeah the the ways that they could be influencing their their they for some reason are not okay any other hey, Irene you're muted Irene that's it yeah, I think you've just touched, Fiona, on um, there was, a, we have to start with the young. And there was a very interesting article in the Times this week about the headmistress who's been in the news because she wanted her school to be non-denominational, shall we say, and she had a big riot with a child that started to want to pray. So she has tried in her school to have complete diversity. She doesn't want... She wants to bring together all the young children right from the start without, it didn't matter what color they were, what religion they were, they were to integrate within her classroom situations. And I think that's where we have to start. If we don't start with them while they're young, because then they don't see color or, or other forms of racism as, as adults of my age have, have seen it. They they learn. I, I mean, I was very lucky. I I did have friends of different colors and religions when I was young, but a lot of people don't. They're very segregated in their family circles, whether they're of uh, white or whether they're color. And I was very impressed this week reading about this headmistress. I thought she had the right idea, and it and in what you've been talking about tonight, I think that really is where we need to start. If we don't educate the young to look at everybody the same and on their abilities, then we're never going to win this situation. Yeah, agree a thousand percent, yeah. 
Hey, Peter, you're, you've just muted yourself, Peter. Peter, you're still, muted. Still muted. You're still, still muted. Mu you're talking to yourself, Peter. That's it. There we go. Okay, sorry. Um, yes, following on from Irene's point, um, I don't know if it makes sense against the uh, point I tried to make earlier, but one of the terrible ironies of this situation with uh, this head teacher in this school in London, I agree with Irene that um, I think her approach is probably as good as anything we're seeing today. And I agree that we, starting with the young, is probably the best place to start. But much of the political establishment, much of that establishment which would regard itself as progressive, is directly opposed to most of the things that Google Singh is doing. And this is something, again, I find absolutely impossible to get my head around. Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah, me both, Peter. Yeah. Okay, if there's just oh, Jim, Jim Tatchell. I've got one more question actually to, to finish up. And are, are there any grounds for optimism? It's been a, a fairly bleak um, uh, feeling, I think, that we're um, that we're seeing here. Um, from a political perspective. We have a prime minister who's non-white in Rishi Sunak. We have a mayor of London who's non-white in Sadiq Khan and um, a home secretary who's also non-white. So is that signs of positive change or do you think that um, that, that makes no difference? I think that it, it does it does um of course show a shift in in society that that these people well that, that Sadiq Khan has, you know was elected rather than um you know and maybe 20 years ago that would not have been a thing um there are unfortunately um you know Suella Braverman and uh Brody Patel they were people of color but they were doing an enormous amount of damage to people of color, especially refugees. Um, and the reason that their, you know, the party allowed them to get that to that position was because they were following those lines and doing that damage. And um, having a person of color in a position just as a token actually um, is, uh, more damaging because it looks like progress but is actually they're just there as a token they're just there as a figurehead but they they're not um making the progress that we want them to be making um but obviously you know i'm looking at things from from a shorter time span um and overall you know if we go back you know to 20 40 60 years ago things of course are progressing and we it is good to when I reflect back on those times if I think about 1960s wasn't alive but they but if you look at them till now that's how I kind of get my fuel that you know things can progress if we take action and I would just encourage everyone to think about their circle of influence you know maybe we've talked about how important education is but maybe you have no circle you know influence in any realm of education but there is somewhere that you have influence and like, what is that one small thing that you can do um, that could, you know, help move things forward in the direction that we all want them to go. There's a number on the, on the call involved with directly with education, Fiona. So I'm sure we're all taking the message away with you. Yeah. Just one final comment. There is a note in the chat that, uh, that Simon put in there, hopefully, um, which I'm not sure everyone will have seen, but there is a, a body in East Hearts called the East Hearts Black Parents Assembly, um, and that they might be a good sounding board and contact start point for potential trustees, or trustees, if you look at us, uh, trustees, 
Um, and that is East Hearts Black Parents Assembly.co.uk. So that's in the chat. So I'd just like to draw everyone's attention to that. Thank you, Simon. And thank you so much, Fiona, as well. Well, thank you so much, uh, Fiona. You, you shocked me last time and you shocked me again. I'm starting to question on my gracious because I was convinced I was not. Um, could I just... Um, the discussion, uh, I think you've, you've made us all feel quite uncomfortable, which is which is a good thing, I think. Um, right, as I said at the beginning, uh, this is our 43rd talk, and we've decided to take a break for a few months as we look to how to interest a wider audience. And any ideas on this will be very welcome. Uh, the fact that we've had 5,000 people watching uh, these talks over the last three years is encouraging enough. Um, and also, Fiona, I wish you well in April. Hope everything, well, I'm sure everything will go well. And um, I'm sure the, the, uh, so good luck with all that. Thank you. And that just leaves me to invite you all to join me in toasting the King, Rotary, and all those living in so many very challenging parts of the world. Rotary, the King, and all those suffering. So, Thanks very much, Fiona. And you're going to send stuff to me that I can circulate. Is that right? Yeah, I'll send this, the slides and then some of those other bits that we were talking about. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you. Bye.